couple more time. Here we go. So Fred, welcome. We're so excited to have you with us this morning and hear more from you. This is Fred Fellman interviewing for position port position five. Thank you. Over to you, Fred, to start. All right. If you can just bear with me one second, I have a, a moment of technical challenge, but I will be ready here in just a second. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity. I'm Port of Seattle Commissioner Fred Fellman, and I'm seeking a third term on the commission because it's really been a privilege and an honor to be able to serve the community, King County, and I feel I have a lot to still offer. During my tenure, I've been committed to advancing the triple bottom line that enables commerce communities and the climate to coexist. But the reality is most people don't even pay attention to the commission until their Amazon box or a flight is delayed. And the fact is now everybody can talk about supply chain challenges when people know that there's challenges. That's when they know about the commission. So, but I've focused my, my attention for many years before serving on the commission to make it a more green and sustainable entity. So, but I focus now on the commission of creating good paying jobs and for the region, reducing the impacts on the environment and our fence line communities. While ensuring that the port is a leader in reducing our carbon footprint and that of our tenants. We've also made significant investments in green infrastructure and improving customer service that supports our growing region. I'm committed to continuing this work with our partners to address the challenges we face and seize new opportunities as we make a transition to a carbon-free economy. I'm running for re-election because I believe we can do even more to create a sustainable, equitable, and prosperous future for everyone in the region. And I've been dedicated to this work since the first cruise ship showed up in 2000. I'd be honored to have the opportunity to serve you once again for my third term. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shep is going to ask the first question. Over to you, Shep. Gates at the new international terminal at SeaTac were not designed uh, to be large enough for the intended planes. How does this happen? And how will you prevent this sort of problem from occurring in future projects? Thank you for the question. The future, well, it's completely unacceptable that there can't be these four additional gates at the IAF at this time. I can't go into very detailed things because this is before the courts, but I can say that it's hard to imagine how there could be a confusion as to whether the gate should be built for wide body jets when that's what's used at an international facility. The commission has been kept apprised of the various cost overruns due to design changes, COVID, et cetera, over the course of the construction because we have to approve the budget items in open commission meetings. When it was obvious the project was running badly over budget, the commission had then hired a team of aviation experts to do a forensic review of the contracting process and found some of the things that will be changed in the type of contracting we do as we pursue projects in the future. But that had to do with cost overruns. However, I'm dismayed to have learned and expressed so to the executive staff that we should have been made aware of these foundational problems long before it hitting the press. I made sure that there, we've discussed this thoroughly during our Tuesday's executive session coming up, but we can't say much more than that. As far as moving forward, it's important to recognize the commissioners hire the executive director, who in turn hires the airport director, who then is responsible for airport operations. And in fact, we won the highest Skytrax rating for customer service in the past two years. The degree to which port staff is responsible to inspect construction projects once designs and contracts are in place will be made more clear to me. And once such problems have been identified, we will be notified sooner in the future, regardless. There will be regular updates on major projects to address issues beyond just cost overruns in the future. And we have done, as we've done with Seaport Alliance during the construction challenges we faced with building Terminal 5 by West Seattle. That should cover it. Great. Thank you so much. Question number two will be asked by Toby. Toby? Hi, Fred. Um, much of the port's core economic activities cause huge externalities and other environmental impacts, especially on low-income immigrant and BIPOC communities. How do you propose to make the port less damaging to the environment and more economically equitable? Well, 
Okay. The um, this is this is foundational to my reasons for serving on the court. It's clear that the port has these huge regional benefits, but the fence line communities take a disproportionate impact associated with that. So I've been trying to do serious things, various things at the airport and seaport to both reduce the impact, but also to make sure that the fence line communities have the opportunities to benefit from the economic opportunities that the port provides so that they can live in those communities in which places that are like being gentrified right now at um, around the the, the seaport. And we just met with the EPA uh, environmental justice staff yesterday with the DRCC specifically to address these questions. At the airport, we're trying to, you know, it, we're making huge progress to get sustainable aviation fuels into the jets that are flying, reducing uh, their, their uh, noise and the approaches, providing insulation for the houses and re-insulating them, protecting parks around the area in the airport. At the seaport, we're also electrifying the waterfront. We're making quiet zones for the trains that are going to be coming back and forth to T5 in growing numbers and actively looking at right now reducing the emissions of drayage trucks. But you really have to measure that which you care about. So we have the, every five years, we have the uh, air inventory for the entire region. And then we ratchet down with specific uh, plans for every every five years to reduce the both carbon and conventional pollutants in the area. We're not just measuring the overall for the first time, we're also looking at the trajectories and where those emissions go into communities. So things like trucks, which are a relatively small amount of the tire pollution for the area are right within the communities. So there are things that we know we have to do and there's a lot of attention being paid to it at the state and federal level right now. Thank you, Fred. The next question will be asked by Pat. Over to you, Pat. Okay, uh, good morning. The Green Cruise Corridor may eventually reduce the imp enormous impact of, of climate uh, from cruise ships. However, the science is telling us that we need to reduce our, our emissions now in order to avoid uh, its harmful impacts. How will you measure life cycle greenhouse gas emissions on the whole Alaska cruise route next year, and how will you ensure that we have zero emissions achieved by 2040? Well, thank you. I, you know, the reason why I came to the port after studying killer whales was I looked at the ships as another species to study. And when the cruise ship arrived, I go, well, that's not just a ship. And so where is it going? And followed it to the port, which brought me to becoming a commissioner eventually. So I've been spending you know, since that time working on reducing the maritime emissions, the marine emissions from crews, and have continued to do that, and have started this novel approach of using the tariffs, the leases, and berthing agreements to make up for the fact that we don't have regulatory authority of these ships. And in fact, including expanding those, those agreements, we're actually working with Mary Lou Dickerson in the day we were passing legislation to try to address this, which resulted in an MOU that extends our reach further offshore. However, we can mostly provide the shoreside infrastructure, which we've done. We had the first two berths to be electrified. Our third berth is about to be. But I've been really championing the use of green fuels, which is one of the primary things that the, cruise, the green corridor is going to try to do. Being a commissioner, I get to talk to the higher level folks. And just this past week, I met with the president of Carnival Corp, which is over half the ships, as well as their chief operating engineer nationally. And I said, look, Green card is going to take a long time. Does, nothing stops you from being an industry leader. And in fact, because I'm very much involved with the clean fuels initiatives, both at the state and federal level, as well as working with the airlines and maritime, I know some of the places that are being producing the fuels and are working with King County to use their municipal solid waste to do so as well. So we're going to introduce the folks at the Carnival Corporation with Nesty next week at the Nordic Heritage Museum part of their innovation summit and talk to them about the fact that there's going to be fuels to be used you should start sooner than later thank you fred the last question this morning and then we will go to follow up will be asked by amanda to you amanda mm -hmm. the truckers who transport containers to and from the port are independent contractors and low-wage workers these workers often cannot afford trucks that are low polluters as a port commissioner, what will you do to address the low wages of these workers, 
What will you do to address the pollution emitted by the trucks these drivers are using? Thank you. That was one of the first things that I addressed second to the cruise ships. And, you know, it was uh, actually uh, Pramila Jayapal that sort of said, Fred, we got to deal with this. And that was like, a, you know, before she was even elected and uh, to the Congress. And so I've, I've looked at the, the driver's challenges with seriousness that one of the things that's very much important to keep in mind, they're only paid per turn that they make. So one of the things that's in our elevated mutual interest is to improve the efficiency by which the terminals operate so they're not sitting online idling and not making money. So we're actively looking at things like smarter gates and advanced scheduling for, you know, you know you're coming to an appointment to pick up a specific container. We are also, we make these requirements that you can't have a 2007 or older truck coming onto the terminal with a terminal agreement but this, and we've had this for international terminals, and now we're setting it to the domestic terminals, but even that transition to relatively inexpensive newer trucks, um, we did low income loans. I extended the deadline for implementing that at the same time, giving them credit for doing particle traps and other things like that. We're actively looking at finding ways to come up with uh, lease agreements or, you know, a yeah, lease to own opportunities for these very expensive electric trucks, identifying parking lots and uh, infrastructure for them to do. And right now I'm going to go to Texas next week for a tourism conference, but I'm making a special trip to see a project called Idle Air at a, in Laredo, Texas, where they have like scaffolding that hangs over a truck stop with a conduit that comes down and they can dial in their air conditioning or heating, plug in their cell phone, and turn off their engines. So, you know, in the transition, waiting for well, getting clean fuels like the, all the port vehicles operate on, we can have these operations where greener truck stops near the communities. Thank you so much, Fred. Now we will go to follow up questions from our e board. Please raise your hand. Toby's the first to ask. Oh, oh sorry. You. One second, Toby, just to clarify, these are one minute follow ups. Toby? Uh, thanks for your work. That's impressive. Um, uh, there was an article in the paper a few weeks ago about, uh, and if you can't answer this, I understand because it might be in litigation. It, it is in litigation, but what what role does do you have uh, as a commissioner over the litigation against SeaTac for the air pollution? Did you see that the class action from Hoggins Berman? Yeah, Berman, who did the cigarette case, and so it's a formidable po opponent, uh, challenger. You know, the, the, I think the, you know, we will be involved with the case. The, the lawyers will, you know, present us with a draft. We're, we're, you know, named party with Delta and Alaska. I mean, I think, you know, without having talked to the attorneys yet, you know, we don't manufacture planes or fuels. We're not, you know, we nothing we do is illegal. Right. Um, the fact that they're they're making the claim that because we've, you know, expanded gates, <clears throat> that this in turn is um, complicit with the known challenges associated with the air quality. You know, we are meeting uh, these growth uh, demands, but at the same time, like I said, we're doing all sorts of things to try to reduce the footprint of the planes and reduce the impacts on the communities with HEPA filters and various other things. So. We take our responsibilities seriously and we'll see how the courts think. Thank you, Fred. Jeremy? Um, so you, in a, in a few of the questions, you um, you brought up uh, sustainable fuels, um, like how um, how green fuels could help a problem with, um, with uh, you know, fence line communities. An another, another one, you had mentioned green fuels as part of the... Um, is part of the um, solution for the cruise emissions problems. Um, can you go into a little bit more on what these green fuels are, where they come from, and and just how we know that these are genuinely renewable and we're not just playing an emission shell game? Yeah, that's a foundational question. Thank you. We uh, contracted the Washington State University a couple of years ago to look at what are truly sustainable feedstocks that we could use in the region so we don't even have transportation challenges that we could source. And the two identified were municipal solid wastes and woody debris. And there is a project down in Grays Harbor where they have access 
greater access to woody debris. And of course, we don't want that to be incentives to overly clean out forests, although there is that dynamic with, you know, fire maintenance and all that. But so, um, so I have this half million dollar contract jointly funded with King County, looking at converting municipal solid waste. It was just a big contract left, $33 million government subsidy and with lands and tech in, in uh, England. Um, and when there's a project in Fulcrum. So really the, the trash to fuel is what I'm pursuing. It's not incineration and we'll see how well we can do. <clears throat> I put myself in the queue. Thank you, Fred. I would love to hear some of your thoughts and reflections across these questions that we've asked about the public health impacts and the disproportionate burden that we are seeing in terms of reduced life expectancy. So it's just kind of a bigger picture. As a, as a through line, we've talked about the environmental implications, but I would love to hear your thoughts about taking it one step forward into a kind of public health framework and, and what thinking and, and work related to this overarching issue of the impact of the port um, in these different areas on public health. Thank you. Well, you know, this whole thing about environmental justice is like in the buzzword of the day. But the fact is, if you're involved with environmental impact statements or SEPA analysis, this this is, you know, the human environment is part of the analysis. And so the, the significant change uh, difference, I think, is, is that some of these communities are more cumulatively impacted. But cumulative impacts are also needed to be considered in an EIS. So this is something that has just been foundational to my review of proposals that come to before us. As a commissioner, I have the ability to do something about it instead of just complaining about it. And I take that very seriously. So the communities around the airport are certainly very heavily impacted by the growth of the airport. It's the fastest growing airport in the country. So they are getting a lot of attention, but we've had historic, much longer relationships with the communities around South Park. And because we have leaders like Paulina Lopez who have made sure that we don't ignore them and I continue to work with them as I spend all day yesterday with them. Thank you. Are there more follow-up questions from our e-board? Laura Marie. Hello again. Um, Fred, can you just tell us one or some of your favorite parts about the Port Commissioner role? Well, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, uh, maybe short of being a candidate. It's a very different skill set. Um, but it's something that I felt that, you know, there's, I've spent so much of my career, you know, 40 years of trying to be moving the system from the outside. It's a big ship and it moves slowly and it takes a lot of force and it's tremendously frustrating. But at the same time, when you nudge it, you can make a big impact. So, I mean, my my favorite saying is, what I lack in talent, I make up for in perseverance. And I will continue to chug along and I just see the progress that we're being made specifically on the environment. That's why I have expertise to share with the community. But the, the fact is, like you said, that improving the environment improves people's lives. And if we can get people involved with the green economy that's coming forward, these are things that I just see as foundational changes. And with the waterfront converting, I'm part of that too. You can be a commissioner at any time. This is an exciting time. Thank you, Fred. We can have one quick follow-up, Jeremy. <clears throat> I, you, met, you mentioned the waterfront uh, conversion. Um, what, um, so this past week, a new four-lane road, um, the new Elliott Way just opened. Um, and obviously it's a road that wasn't there before. Um, it's probably going to drive a lot of more new induced demand. What is the Port of Seattle's role in that? And how how will you mitigate new demand from new more cars? We're actually very much trying to reduce the impacts between the bicycles and the cars, specifically in front of the cruise ship terminal at 66. The fact is these ships are getting so large that the amount of people coming and going creates quite a hazard for bicyclists and pedestrians. So we are hoping that that diversion up Elliott Way um, will take off some of the pressure on the waterfront and allow bicyclists to come from East Marginal all the way to, um, you know, uh, Myrtle Edwards Park. But we are actually creating a bike path 
on the east side of the road. In fact, we're ripping up that whole George Benson rail track, which this incredible right of way along the waterfront that's currently unusable. It's one of the things I've been pushing on for a long time so that they can divert around the, around the cruise terminal during cruise hours and get back on. So I don't think the induced demand is going to be from making the waterfront more desirable to be there, not because of the, of the road, and the road might help deconflict that usage, in my opinion. Thank you so much, all around, Fred. I'm going to ask Jeremy to give us a brief recap of what happens next. Thank you so much for the time this morning. Jeremy? Um, 